you uh, and welcome. And um, we've had Dognition, we've had website inventors, but I know what you really came here for, and that was canine genomics. So <laughs> finally, now we're going to talk about something everyone's looking forward to. So really, what I want to talk about is the canine genome and some of the work that's been done in that, but more importantly, why is it important? And then get to the point, why are canines so important to us as humans? So in December 2004, the Canine Genome, a $30 million project that was funded by the National Human Genetic Research Institute, was announced in a small meeting in Utrecht, Netherlands. The funding for that work was justified by the emerging fact that the canine is an unrivaled model in which to study many inherited traits that include health defects. While it was primarily human-centric in its purpose, the knowledge of the canine genome and, the, and continuing to study it has provided profound implications and will continue to provide this type of implications for human and veterinary research and medicine, but also to all biological scientists, such as myself, a nutritionist. So why, then, is this field of genomics so important to biology? <clears throat> biology is very complex, and especially in higher mammals. Millions of cells clustered together in tissues and organs that are tasked with a particular responsibility for the whole organism. Be it reproduction, or movement, growth and maturation, or all of the systems that support that, such as a renal system, a digestive tract, a circulatory system, or neural tissue. All of those things are clusters of cells doing specific things. And they must do so in an ever-changing world. A term that scientists use is homeostasis, all cells trying to remain constant in a very heterodynamic world that is changing around them minute to minute, day by day. So the cells must build these proteins, the machines of the cellular factory, that perform all of the tasks. And they must do so and change their protein contents depending on what their needs are. And they do this by reading the DNA instructions. And they do this, again, as I said, changing all of the time. And so the scientific knowledge around the structure the organization, and the operation of the genome is critical if we are to build an even more fundamental understanding about how our dogs and how all animals operate, how they cope, how they regulate, how they survive, and even thrive in a world that changes around us constantly. So if we look at these processes linearly, the DNA is the instruction book for everything an animal could be. Anything that dog perhaps could be is inside its DNA. But the regulation of that begins in the womb, in a field that's now emerging known as epigenetics, over the genome. The genome is actually programmed by experiences that the mother or even the grandparents have had. And now we're learning, programmed even by the things that we experience after we've been born. And then the expression of the DNA is through another molecule called RNA, depicted on the screen behind me as a big cloud or cluster or constellation of sub-information that that particular cell needs to be uniquely that cell. And then there's the proteins, the machines, as I mentioned, that do all of the work. Those cells building and degrading proteins as they interact with their environment and understand what they need to do at any particular time. And finally, the final product, depicted in this cartoon, is simply a molecule. But it's where the rubber meets the road. It's the phenotype. It's your dog's hair coat. It is your cat's personality. It is all of those things that make an animal that particular animal. It, it has profound implications on health, on longevity and personality. And it is why we must continue to study biology at the genomic level. 
So why is the canine genomic work so important to humans? We've shared our world with our furry face friends for a very long time. Current uh, estimates are 15, 16,000 years. Long before other domestications took place, we heard Sandra say cats about 9,000 years ago when we became an agricultural uh, society. But long before that, while we were still hunters and gatherers, is when we began our journey that led to the dogs of today. And because of that, we've shared the same environment, the same challenges, the same threats. And that has led to canines and humans sharing many of the same health concerns. Couple that with the, uh, the um, fact that the development of and maintenance of our breeds that we know today requires intense genetic selection. And with all of the wonderful things that that results in, it also has collateral effects that include inherited disorders. And so it's no wonder that our current breeds today are an excellent model in which to understand deeper the things that are important to human medical research. Listed behind me are some of the conditions, only a few of them actually, that have advanced because of the study of the canine genome. I guess we'd say they're truly man's best friend when it comes to companionship, but also some of the areas that are of, of importance to us as we learn more and more about our health. But it is not a one-way street. Those of us who are in science studying canines find the human an excellent model for those, those health conditions that affect our canines. So it's no wonder that our dogs also consider us friends. But as I listen to the talks today and contemplate, why is canine genomics so interesting? Why do so many articles in our top scientific um, journals, when involving dogs, end up on the cover and in the news? Why is it that so many geneticists I know who have started in human medicine carved out a significant portion of their professional careers, including Dr. Hare, as we heard today, for canine work? And many of them have converted completely to the study of canines. Why is that? Well, it's simple, right? It's because they're dogs, and, and most of us love dogs. And I think that's part of the answer. But what is it about this bond that we're hearing about? And we're going to hear more about when we hear uh, Marty Becker talk in a bit. It, there's just something magical about it. And it made me think very long and hard about this relationship and how it came about that they're just so important to us. <clears throat> Perhaps part of it, maybe a big part of it, is because we created dogs that long ago, when we first began interacting with wild wolves, led to cohabitation and ultimately adoption of certain wolves and keeping and breeding those that had characteristics that we liked as, as humans. And that then was the beginning of a unknowingly human selecting for certain traits that ultimately became the gene pool that makes our dogs what they are today. Not wolves, clearly not wolves. They are a completely different species, our dogs, now known as Canis familiaris. Wolves scavenging our early settlements before villages, uh, our hunter and gatherer settlements, found food near these humans. And it favored those wolves that had a lowered fear flight response. And it also favored those wolves that were able to read the intentions of man, to read the body language of humans and know, is that human going to give me something to eat or is he gonna club me over the head? Very important distinction and we heard some of that earlier from Dr. Hare. So, at that point, the selection started. The selection, an accelerated use of evolution. Evolution, the tool our creator made so as to allow us to change over time. But it was evolution on steroids. While natural selection is slow and random, 
such as a giraffe that has a slightly longer neck and can reach the leaves in the top of a tree and therefore has an advantage over those with a shorter neck and survives longer and therefore propagates her DNA. Or the moth that has a particular color wing and likes a certain type of leaf on a certain tree has no idea the effect that has on its ability to be seen by a hungry bird. These early encounters with wolves did result, result in cohabitation and adoption, and ultimately in a relationship where these wolf dogs became sentries, hunting partners, food, and companions to early humans. And as that relationship built, undoubtedly, our early parents saw their children delight in their interactions with their companions and that slowly evolved into the relationship that we now enjoy today with our dogs. Interestingly, that occurred over a period of about 15, 16,000 years, but it has only been in a mere 200 years that we have taken dogs, and they truly were dogs then, but we take general types of dogs and have developed them into over 350 distinct and unique breeds. So let's look at this carefully. The diversity that we see in dogs today is great. So great that Charles Darwin actually speculated that Canis familiaris was actually descended from many multiple species of canid, not just one. But we know today that that's not true. We know today that our dog's sole ancestor was but Canis lupus, the gray wolf. But we were in a real hurry to get there with these dogs. If you look on your left here, that is the skull conformation of a weasel and a walrus. And certainly they're very different. But they also have a lot of similarities. Those two animals are separated by 60 million years of time. If you look to the far right of this slide, you see the skull conformation differences between a pug and a Great Dane. One could argue equally as dissimilar, separated by 200 years in time. So truly, the human selection process has allowed us to do things very rapidly that given natural time would have taken much longer. All of this variation from the gray wolf and all of this time shared together has led to the wonderful advances that we've had in science and in medicine. But more importantly, and I know as all of us are appreciating today, it has led to the wonderful and noble species that we call Canis familiaris. So from this wild wolf, we have many, many breeds of dogs. We have breeds that differ in size from a two and a half pound chihuahua to a 250-pound Mastiff. We have dogs that can do all sorts of things, fun things, important things. They can delight us in the way they wiggle and the way they wag. And they, <laughs> and they certainly um, give us much, much joy when we run our hands through the, their different coats. And they know us and they read us, and they know our moods perhaps better than we know ourselves. They never judge us, and they never give up on us. So I would like to leave you with a thought that in life, and in learning, and in all endeavors that are mankind, we can rest assured that we will share that journey with our companions, Canis familiaris, our dogs. They will always be there for us, and I hope that you all would agree that we really are better with pets. Thank you very much. <laughs>